Hello and welcome to Money, Markets and More with me, Dominic Frisby. And today's piece is called The Inexorable Rise of the Far Right and What to Do About It. I was never particularly interested in politics growing up. My dad was. He was an active social democrat. I remember him jumping up and down with excitement when the SDP was formed as um, David Owen, Roy Jenkins and Shirley Williams broke away from the Labour Party in, I think it was 1984, I can't remember exactly when it was, but even as a student, I never really got interested in politics beyond having a feeling that something wasn't right. I felt I should be left-wing, but uh, that, that was the right thing to be, but I never felt particularly engaged, only alienated. And my vague understanding of political ideology was that Stalin and the Bolsheviks were far left and that Hitler and the Nazis were far right. I didn't realise back then that Nazi meant National Socialist. And that far left and far right were actually quite close in philosophy. So it was horseshoe theory, basically. And it seemed that actual far right was something that didn't really exist in the UK. There was Oswald Mosley, but he was a bit of a laughing stock, and I think he was actually left wing by his own definition. And there was the National Front, but that was sort of small and ineffectual. Now, in my mid to late 30s, as a result of studying gold and sound money and limited government, I discovered libertarianism. And for the first time, here was a political philosophy that resonated with me. Government is inherently incompetent, inefficient and inequitable. The more it does, the worse things seem to get. The less it does, therefore, the better. A multiplicity of individual decisions, to quote uh, John Cooper Thait, who was governor of Hong Kong, will produce a better and wiser result than a single decision by a government or by a board, with its inevitably limited knowledge of the myriad factors involved and its inflexibility. A multitude of individual decisions. And it amazes me that somebody who advocates peace, free trade, less government, and in the case of anarchism and anarcho-capitalism, no government at all, how they can be sectioned off with Nazis and labelled far-right. Far-right involves more government, not less. And to say far-right libertarian, as The Guardian did the other day to describe Argentina's new president, Javier Millet, it's surely oxymoronic, or maybe just plain moronic. At best, it's lazy and ignorant. At worst, it's the stuff of smearing and straw men and willfully dishonest. I used to think it's the former. Now, most of the time, I realise it's the latter. Now, I'm proud to have written the Libertarian National Anthem, which distills libertarian philosophy. And the lyrics read, Arise, libertarians, above totalitarians, our guide is the mighty invisible hand. Reject state controllers, collect us patrollers, our choices are better than government plans. Taxation is a form of theft. Free markets and free trade are best. Free speech, free movement, free minds and free choice. Our actions are all voluntary, not coerced or compulsory. War we abhor, socialism does not work. No debt or inflation, no stealth confiscation, no pigs in the trough at the gravy to drink, no state education to brainwash our nation, no experts dictate what to do, what to think. We scorn your fiat currency. Gold and Bitcoin is our money. We own ourselves and we live and let live. We take responsibility, life, love and liberty. Leave us alone. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Now, how is any of that far right? And by the way, if you want to watch the video of that, which I heartily recommend, I'll put a link in the comments. So what actually is far right? It's time for a Wikipedia definition. Historically, far-right politics has been used to describe the experiences of fascism, Nazism and phalangism. Kind of what I thought. But here's the problem. They have done the change the definition thing. Contemporary definitions now include neo-fascism, neo-Nazism, the third position, the alt-right, racial supremacism and other ideologies or organisations that feature aspects of authoritarian, 
ultra-nationalist, chauvinist, xenophobic, theocratic, racist, homophobic, transphobic or reactionary views. So basically, far right can be anything you don't agree with. And the name derives from the left uh, right political spectrum, with the far right considered further from the centre than the standard political right. Of course, the whole prism of left and right is false in any case. Authoritarian v libertarian is much more telling, and the political compass is the best scale of all. But so overused is the term far right that the political compass is starting to look something like this. Now, I've argued many times, starting with life after the state, that healthcare, education and welfare would all be cheaper and of a higher standard if the government stayed out of it. The internet is the most powerful learning tool ever created and it is almost free. The only price you pay is your data. In the context of the times, the friendly societies of the 19th century were much better providers of care than the state equivalent we have today. But somehow, if you argue that state care is no good and that we should do away with it, people think you are advocating a society with no care at all and therefore you are fascist and far right. It's not about wanting the best care for people though is it really with them it's about control. So last week we saw the election of Javier Millet in Argentina who is a self-pronounced libertarian and anarcho-capitalist. His rants denouncing the state are the stuff libertarian wet dreams are made of. And I know the purists say he's a WEF stooge, please. Real life will never be as clean as idealists and theorists would like. It's muddy, it's impure. Just take the win. Malay's victory is good for the libertarian cause, even if only for the PR it has given the word anarcho-capitalist or words. And if his policies actually start to work, the potential for other countries to copy and for libertarianism to spread multiplies. Nevertheless, he is, as we learn from The Guardian, far right. Then last week we had the Algerian migrant in Ireland who went on a stabbing spree at a school in Dublin, counting three small children and a woman among his victims. Many Irish people, like the rest of Europe, have had their concerns about large-scale migration ignored by their leaders who have set pro-immigration policies in place for years. They've had their concerns ignored for years, is what I'm saying, and they've seen increased racial tension, increased crime, especially violent crime, rape, criminals released from prison early due to overcrowding, unaffordable housing, getting even more unaffordable, schools, healthcare, transport, infrastructure, all struggling to cope with the increased numbers. But the stabbing made something snap, and Dublin saw the biggest riots it has seen in living memory. And then came the reporting. This was the Telegraph, who should know better. Far-right violence flares in Dublin after five-year-old girl seriously hurt in knife attack. Who committed the knife attack? Was that not violent, or did it just happen? And why the passive voice for the knife attack, but the active for the reaction? You're far right if you're angry about kids being stabbed. The Irish leadership took no responsibility. This had nothing to do with their policies, of course. Instead, it too blamed the far right. It was hooligans driven by far right ideology, said of the head of, the head of police. My breath was taken away by T. Such Leo Varadkar, who as good as ignored the crime but condemned the reaction as racist. And he said it has no place in multicultural Ireland. And then pledged more censorship and clamping down of hate speech. The problem isn't that Ireland is being flooded with unassimilable predatory aliens, as John Carter so eloquently wrote uh, on his substack. The problem isn't that a little girl was stabbed by one of them. No, the problem is that the Irish have a problem with it. The far right, it seems, is now everywhere. Brexit was a far right thing. The Dutch feeling threatened by mass Muslim immigration is a far right thing. 
Argentina deciding that enough is enough after umpteen hyperinflations, large-scale corruption and Lord knows what else is far right. Even being opposed to the inequitable tax that is ULES is far right, apparently. By that measure, anyone opposed to tax, Robin Hood, Gandhi, Boudicca, the Peasants' Revolt, the American and French revolutionaries, yeah, they were all far right. Both Just Stop Oil and Black Lives Matter are self-proclaimed far-left organisations. They call themselves far-left. They describe themselves as far-left. Why does the media never call them far-left? There hasn't been a sudden rise or re-emergence of the far-right. There has just been a rise in name-calling by a media that operates with dual standards. And the name-calling can be justified because the definition of what is far-right has been changed. And now people who are unhappy about a child being stabbed can be bracketed with Hitler. Do you remember the Nice terror attack in 2016? A Muslim terrorist drove a truck into a crowd of people celebrating Bastille Day and he killed 84 people. How did the media report that? Passive voice again. This is the BBC headline. Killed by lorry. No mention of the driver, his background or political affiliation. Just the passive voice. But anyone who reacts to murderous conduct by an illegal immigrant is far right. When people are angry because George Floyd is killed and we get several months of looting, that's fine, that's justified because of history. But when three Irish kids are stabbed and the Irish get hacked off about it, that's far right. It's such blatant double standards. Here we see Oxford men. We all know the media lies and has probably always lied, but it also has to be truthful at the level it operates. And the switching between active and passive voice is effectively lying and sophistry. When the truth is so obviously ignored by a media too scared to call a shovel a shovel, people will inevitably lose trust in it. And thank God for alternative media. That's all I can say. Or should I say alt-right media <laughs> or far-right media? At least there's a truth to it. Give me a citizen journalist at the heart of the action over a hack any day of the week. And I don't think anyone minds people applying to come to a country, working hard, contributing, being respectful and so on. But they do mind lots of fighting age young men coming illegally, stabbing people, raping women, exhausting local resources such as accommodation, education, healthcare, all the rest of it, and then being called racist and far-right for raising objections. If you keep calling people far-right Nazis, they will eventually start behaving like far-right Nazis, as my friend uh, Low Status Opinions keeps saying to me. That's another substack. The longer moderate political parties ignore the concerns of those who elected them, then the more they will, people will be driven to extremes, extremism. It's all very well saying the mainstream media is dead. There's no doubt that it is in decline, but it still has enormous influence. The quicker it dies, the better, in my opinion. Then some kind of genuine free market can return and replace the monopolistic media we've endured for the last few decades. I say free market can return to the media. Maybe I should say far-right market. <laughs> can return. But when all is said and done, we're seeing a battle for control of the narrative, and one side is losing. And that's when they start using smears like far right. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. Uh, I'll be back with another video very soon. Please subscribe to the channel. Until then, goodbye! And there are all sorts of links in the comments. If you're interested in buying gold, of course, as always, uh, I recommend the Pure Gold Company. Till next time, goodbye.